so excited about this morning because I, I'm so aware that um, God's communication has got just as much to do with your ears as what it has to do with my tongue. Now, His anointing and His self-revelation is not, um, thankfully, not just dependent on my understanding or my communication, but God reveals Himself. And the communication is almost just like that broadband connection. But the content is God himself. So why don't you just right now just, uh, just speak to him yourself and say, Father, reveal yourself. Just make yourself known. I, I give you my ears. I give you my eyes. I, I pray that you communicate and reveal yourself what to the extent and, and the depth where no ear is heard, no eye is seen, not, not, not as it entered the imagination of man, what God reveals by His Spirit. So Lord, we, we thank you for your word, for your self-revelation. Awesome. Woo! It's not that David goes by, but I don't search for words to try and express the the beauty and the enormity the awesomeness wow. of this God who has revealed himself and um, when we when we think about the story of Jesus and that's really what I want to speak of this morning is what does the story of Jesus have to do with my story oh. okay what what is this story of Jesus Christ? How is it connected with your story? Because there's a part of this story, the story of Jesus, that is historic. Um, but that's only a part of it. There's a part of this story that is about the present reality of Christ Jesus. But that is also just a part of it. There is a part of the story that continues to unfold into our futures. But that's also just a part of it. <laughs> because beyond the past and the present and the future, the person of Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega, encircles all of time. And comes to make himself known. And you know what? If, if each part of that story is so important, because if we do not understand what happened, the story that is historic, then we will not know how to apply it accurately to our present moment or to our future. If there is no understanding of what he accomplished, then our present experience, it might be a great experience, but it will be shallow. There's a great difference between simplicity and shallowness. You see, there's a, there's a great depth to simplicity. Um, even, even Einstein said that uh, if you can't explain something simply, when you don't understand it well enough. Yeah. And this is a man who, who had great depth of understanding. It wasn't because he was shallow. Now many people say we mustn't get away from the simplicity of Christ. And what they mean actually is the shallowness of the way we explain it. Now there's a great depth to the simplicity and the conclusions we come to in the message of Christ. And so, part of where we get the depth of this message is in understanding the certainty of what has happened, of what was done. You see, if we don't understand that, the next thing that will happen as well is we, we will start placing all our hope in a future event. Wow. We will, like John the Baptist, I, I think it was in... 
So in Matthew 12, he, he sends his disciples to Jesus. And this is the very John that said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There was a moment in which he saw Jesus so clearly, yeah. so accurately. But then because of the contradictions of his circumstances, because of the prison in which he found himself, the death sentence that he awaited, he became disappointed in the very Jesus he once preached. Because his present experience was not what he expected. And so he sends disciples to Jesus and he says, um, ask him, are you the one or should we wait for another? Now there are many Christians, many doctrines, many um, denominations who has not in so many words answered this question, but they have answered this question in their hearts. They might have um, flowered it up and tried to make it beautiful with elaborate end time doctrines, but basically what they're saying is your first coming was a bit of a disappointment. So we're going to place all our hope in another event. And hopefully this time you will do it properly. Oh my God. Wow. Now that is what happens when we do not understand the fullness of time. Of what happened in Christ Jesus. Oh we become disappointed with the Christ who came. And we start placing all our hope in the Christ who is to come. Now I want this morning for us to just delve into the significance of this event that has happened. <laughs> the enormity of this person who has come. Now it's so beautiful in the um, Prince Caspian book uh, uh, where Lucy meets Aslan again and she says, Aslan, Aslan, you're bigger. And he says, yes, it's because you are older. And she said, oh, not because you are? And Aslan says, I am not. But every year that you grow, you will find me bigger. <laughs> you see, I want this morning to speak about the enormity of Christ. And I might show you maybe a vision of who Jesus is and who Christ is that you have not seen before. I might speak about him in terms that you have not thought of before, but all I ask you to do is as you are confronted with these thoughts, is ask yourself does this make him bigger? <laughs> oh, wow. Or does this reduce him? Wow. I think we should at least have as much sense as John the Baptist who said I must decrease. You know, whatever idea I had of him Whatever man-made labels we've placed on him, limitations we've placed on him, let those decrease. But let him increase in our understanding as well. So, I want to look, starting off, with who is this person that becomes flesh. In Jesus Christ. John 1 verse 3. Let's just go there. Um, he says, All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. In other words, all things exist, began in him. He's the one and only creator. Verse 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So when we speak about Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, we're not just speaking of any man. And we're not just speaking about um, a, 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 an event that is limited to history. 
Remember, this is the eternal God. The God who has no beginning nor end. The God who does not exist in time, but the God in whom time exists. This is the God who becomes flesh in the person of Christ Jesus. And let's look at Colossians 1.17. I just want us to first of all realize who this person is who becomes flesh. Because if we realize that, the implications of the incarnation. Incarnation, it's a Latin word. Carnate is, just means flesh. To incarnate is to be made flesh. Um, so Colossians 1.17 He is before that word before also means beyond all things. And in Him all things consist. In other words, all existence, all of time, is held together in Him. Um, let's go to another one. I mean, we can read Hebrews 1 verse 3. It says the same thing, that um, He upholds holds, he sustains the universe by the word of his power. Now it's interesting that scientists these days, they think that the best way to describe the energy out of which all things are made is sound energy. I cannot but help and think of he sustains all things by the word. But it is still the voice of God that, that keeps every molecule <laughs> in existence. That, that is the vibration in every atom. In Him all things consist. Now, let me give a quick, just a quick illustration to try and just give you this idea. When mankind started peering into the nature of reality, they thought, <clears throat> they found the smallest particle that matter is made of when they found the atom. But I mean, they kept on peering and they discovered that the atom is made of many different parts, neutrons, protons, and basically, basically an atom is much more nothing than something. Um, if I explain it this way, if I take a tennis ball or a baseball ball and I attach a string to it, and I swing it around me very quickly, you won't be able to approach me from any side because without getting hit. Because it spins so quickly. Um, but actually, 99.9% .9 of what surrounds me is nothing. It's just that one little bit of something that moves so quickly that it feels like something. So everything that exists, that's made up of atom, it, everything you can touch is much more nothing than something. <laughs> but the little bit of something that's in there moves so quickly that it feels like something. <laughs> wow. And so they started peering into the, the nature of what is that little bit of something, the neutrons, the protons, and that. They found something they called quarks, which is weird stuff that pops in and out of existence. And they don't know where it goes. It's, um, it, it, it's so confusing for them because the more they want to define what reality is and the deeper they peer into it, the more they find nothing. <laughs> and um, so... I mean, one of the things that science even uh, starting to philosophize about is a dimension beyond time and space. And, and they can't help it. Uh, you, you can look this up on YouTube or anything. It's called non-locality or um, the entanglement is another term to use it. And, and what that basically says is if, if two atoms 
are close to one another or they originate in the same spot, then something happens called entanglement, mm -hmm. which means that the spin or the direction of the spin of a neutron in one atom influences the spin or direction of a neutron in another atom. So if you, if you change the spin of the one, the other one changes as well. They don't know why, they just call it entanglement. But here's the weird part. You can now take those two atoms and split them and take them to opposite sides of the universe. They've only done it, they've done it experimentally over large distances. But it works the same no matter what the distance. And even if you put them on opposite sides of this world and you change the direction of the spin of the one, the direction of the spin of the other one instantaneously, without any delay, will change as well. And they call this non-locality or entanglement. And so they're trying to explain it and they're saying, you know, either there's something that moves faster than speed, uh, than light, because light is the fastest thing we know about. But that will just invalidate everything we know about <laughs> science and the world. Um, but many of these scientists now are saying, you know what, we think there is a realm, and these are the words they use, that is beyond time and space. That's why the very theory is called non-locality. Um, it's, and that in reality, those atoms are still touching. <laughs> because they originate from the same source. <laughs> now, um, Let's go a bit further. 1 Corinthians, just, that's just a little part to, to show you that it, this dimension beyond time and space is, not, is testified to both in science, in philosophy, in, in doctrine, in theology. The Bible speaks about the dimension beyond time and space. The good news is that this God who is beyond and before, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, entered our time and became He who was and who is and who is to come. He doesn't just fill the, the space beyond and, uh, and before time, this eternal realm. He also fills all of time. Um, but let's look at 1 Corinthians 8 verse 6. He says, for us, there is one God and Father. Has anyone got the Amplified here? No, but um, that's fine. Go read it in the Amplified. Beautiful there. Of whom are all things, and we are uh, of him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. Have you maybe got it from there? Let me read it to you in the Amplified. It's 1 Corinthians 8 verse 6. So this is how the Amplified says it. Yet for us there is only one God, the Father, who is the source of all things, and for whom we have life, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom and by whom are all things, and through and by whom we exist. So can you see when we speak about Jesus Christ, we speak about the person of God himself in whom all of time and all of existence is held together. This is, and so this means that uh, when he becomes a man, when this God in whom all things consist, when he concentrates his own existence within this one person of Jesus Christ, it has enormous implications for all things in all time. It has enormous implications for your existence and for your time. Because your existence and your time 
was in him when he became a man. In him all things consist. So this event that is in our past where eternity stepped into time. <laughs> uh, you see, through our own efforts and through man's own philosophy and wisdom, we never even got close to knowing God. Our philosophies was words that remained words. Yeah. Our religion was words that remained words. All of it was guesses. But in Jesus Christ, reality himself steps into our time and he, he breaks the silence of our many words, our meaningless words, our meaningless guesses. When he speaks one final word, when the word made flesh, he comes to reveal himself. Now this God in whom all things consist, when, when, when he becomes a man and all things are held together in him, it means that what happens to him happens to all of creation. If he dies, it's the end of all creation. If he's resurrection, resurrected, it is the beginning of a whole new resurrection. See, this is why Ephesians 1 verse 10 speaks about the fullness of God. That God purposed in the fullness of time to bring together everything in heaven and earth into one. That he would sum up all of time in that one event. I'll get back to that. Part of this is to see the enormity of what Christ has done, but the other part is to see the intensity and the focus of what he did. You were present in Christ. Your existence, your time was in him. This is why Paul can say, if one died for all, then all have died. Paul started seeing that we're not dealing with just the ordinary man. We're dealing with the, the man in which all of humanity in all of time is present. This is, this is what theologians call the vicarious humanity of Christ. What they mean by that is in this one person, every man, every person is represented. And so, it has enormous implications for your life. Because this means that the story of Jesus is your story. Hallelujah. And this means that your story is his story. This is the story that, that weaves itself throughout all of time. This is the story that holds all other stories together. Mercy, mercy. This is the story that gives the event that gives meaning to all other events. Because if it wasn't for God himself, eternity that stepped into time, all of time would be meaningless, temporal, purposeless, a flash a vapor that would be over. No matter how much time you can imagine, compared to eternity, it's a vapor. Your 60, 70, 80, 100, 120 years is absolutely nothing compared to eternity. If it wasn't for the eternal God who willingly subjected himself to the limitations of his own creation, stepped into our time to secretly introduce a new life, secretly because it was done in his death, to introduce a new life called the resurrection life, 
a life that gives meaning and purpose to time way beyond what can be measured in time. See, this is where God, in whom all things consist, the past, the present, and the future, this is where he summarizes all of time. You see, when we read of, in Ephesians 1 verse 10, in the fullness of time, um, most commentaries, and most people will understand that it was just at the right time. In other words, all the prophets prophesied about this event. Um, Hebrews 1 verse 3, in times gone past, the prophets, God spoke to our fathers and the prophets, and they all saw in fragments and pieces, but now he has spoken a final word in his son. Um, 1 Peter 1 verse 10, all of them prophesied concerning the, the time and the person. They said the scriptures and it was all pointing towards Christ. Can you see that it was at just the right time? All of history was building up to this event. But we need to understand something more than just the right time. Because God did not just come to fulfill all of time before him. This is the eternal God who in one event came to summarize all of time. All of time past, all of time to come has been summarized and brought to a final conclusion in this one person, Jesus Christ. And you know what? He has come to the most beautiful conclusion about your life. His conclusion is that your life is not just a temporal, meaningless, purposeless existence. He comes to <laughs> infuse your life with eternal value. His conclusion about your life is that you are valuable beyond measure. That you are valuable beyond anything that can be measured within time or space. You have meaning beyond anything you've ever imagined. You have so much value that the eternal God, who is beyond and before time and fills all of time, considers your existence valuable enough to invest his own existence into you. To say, I commit myself to you. In other words, God saying, you know what? I see more value in your life than in heaven. That's why I left heaven. To get to you. See, this is why the gospel is not first of all that there's some place somewhere else that you can go to if you behave. The gospel is, the gospel is first and foremost that God saw a value in your life of such enormity that he left all the privileges, all the joys, all the treasures you can imagine in heaven. He left it to get to you. Because he sees an enormous value in your life. And he doesn't see the limitations of your time, your space as limitations to his life being lived you. See, this, uh, this is why so many people were so disappointed with him. They expected God to show up in, and in a display of his omnipotence, in a display of his omnipresence, omniscience. But he shows up in human form. And if you don't understand the significance of what is communicated in that event, then it will be just another odd event 
of, hey, that's how God chose to do it, but hopefully next time they'll do something more spectacular. The most enormous, the most spectacular, the most significant event that could ever take place has taken place when God emptied himself into human form. You see, this wasn't just another part of his, his message. Not, this is not just another part of the puzzle. This is the entire counsel and dream of God fulfilled. Because what was God's dream from the beginning? His dream from the beginning was the intimacy between himself and man. An intimacy so close that it wouldn't be an intimacy between aliens. But the intimacy in which he himself would be like us. And so to become a man wasn't just something God did out of necessity. God became a man because he wanted to. He, he, this is the God, remember, who knows the end from the beginning. <laughs> he knew he would become a man before he designed Adam. <laughs> Can you see that? He knew that he would become a man and that he would remain a man forever. And so when he speaks in Genesis 1, 26, where he says, and you know, we put in the words, let us, that, just to make it more readable, the word let is not there. It's just like in the other places where he says, um, let the sea bring forth. Um, actually, what he just says in the Hebrew is God was addressing the sea. And he says, sea, bring forth. Etc. Yeah. He speaks to the substance from which he wants to make something new and he commands it to bring forth this new thing. When God speaks, wants to make trees, plants, he speaks to the substance from which trees and plants are made and he speaks to the earth and he says, earth, bring forth plants, animals and the earth brought forth. When God wanted to make man, he spoke to the substance from which man is made and he spoke to himself yes, and he said us bring forth man <laughs> our image our likeness you have a beginning in God yes there's a part of you that's of the earth yes he explains this story further in, in chapter 3 where he says there's a part of you that God formed out of the dust of the earth you see everything else God has spoken to being but with man the artist wants to get his hands dirty and he forms this being out of the dust of the earth he takes such pride in his creation his workmanship and he lifts this lifeless body in front of him. And the words that brings man to life are these words. Where God spoke to himself and he says, Us, bring forth. And that is the breath that he breathes into the nostrils of Adam. And Adam comes alive. See, there's a part of you that began that was created, but there's a part of you that it has its origin in God, that has no beginning, nor end. <laughs> that is why Ecclesiastes 3.11 says that God has placed eternity in the heart of man. The, nor, the King James in many translations says, except that man cannot know the activity of God from beginning to end. The Young's literal translation translated that bit much better. The literal is better here. It says, without which 
In other words, God has placed eternity in the heart of man, without which it would not have been possible to know the activity of God oh, wow. from beginning to end. Yeah. But seeing that He's placed it there, you are able to remember where you began. <laughs> Can you see how John started remembering? John was obsessed with the, the thought of a beginning. An authentic beginning that defines our lives more accurately than anything you've ever experienced within time. You see, um, psychologists tell us that people, a sense of identity is the ability of a person to look at themselves and see themselves as a separate entity. And in order to form and become more secure and more comfortable in your identity, you will then also identify other entities with which you are linked. In other words, people are comfortable to see themselves in the context of their culture, the context of their language, the context of their family upbringing, the context of their career, the context of their achievements. Or maybe they, um, they've allowed their own experiences to define them. So many have allowed the deepest disappointment to become the definition of their lives. In the context of all those things that are so temporal, Jesus comes and he introduces us to a context called eternity in which everything that is temporal disappears. In this context of eternity, there is no culture, there is no um, achievement or disappointment, there is no career. And it's in that context that Jesus says, who are you now? If you are an entity without any connections to anything temporal, who are you then? And the only thing that gives your life identity or meaning is when you come to realize that the real you have got the eternal connection to the eternal God from whom you came. Your origin. And once you discover that identity, it in fuses all the other connections with new meaning. <laughs> you can even look back at your disappointments and become thankful when he has entered your life. Suddenly, <laughs> suddenly you see the God who was. The God who even was with me in what I considered pain and shame and disappointment. And you can suddenly, with new eyes, look back. And the only thing that remains is gratitude. Gratitude. A God who has taken all of your time and summarized it. And everything that stood between you and God, every obstacle, every sin, every contradiction, He brought it to a final end in His death. He is the fullness of time. He is your Omega, your end. He is your Armageddon. The final battle, the final battle in which God wins. Woo! <laughs> He's the Alpha.
sons and Omega. Your beginning. God's original thought about who you are. And God's final conclusion about who you are. Time, your time, has not confused God. He knows you. In the only valid reference, in the only valid um, context, there's a reference to who you are that is outside of space and time. This is why Jeremiah 1 verse 5 says, I knew you when before I formed you. You see, we, let's just consider, let's, let's do what um, Ecclesiastes 3.11 said we should do. Let's remember where we, the activity of God from the beginning. Where did you begin? John 17 verse 24 says that Jesus says, Father, I pray that they may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory and the love with which you love me when? Before the world began. Or beyond. You see, this is Jesus' very invitation to us. For us to join Him, the Alpha and the Omega, in this dimension called eternity. So that we may know ourselves, even as we have always been known. God is not slowly making up his mind about you. God is not watching you daily and wondering, are you going to make it? Are you, are you going to succeed biting his nails? Or are you going to take the right turn? God knows you. <laughs> and his reference for who you are is immovable. Because he knew you before he formed you. And nothing, nothing that happened since you've been formed has changed his mind. <laughs> you see, of course, of course you can take many detours. Of course you can, you can confuse yourself. Of course you can confuse everybody around you. But God has never been confused about who you are. He knows you. And so here, the eternal God steps into time. He becomes a man. Not as an example for you only. He comes as an example of you. This is God's original thought about what man is displayed in a human life. What? See, this is, this is one person in whom God and man are united in perfect harmony. There's no confusion. There's no separation. There's no suspicion. There's no sense of inferiority or lack. There's no, um, there's no conflict between God and man in this one person of Jesus Christ. And this is the example of you. This is God displaying openly. Do you know how I see our relationship? Do you, want to see, do you know how I consider our union? I want to come and reveal to you that I've got no problem in believing in my unity with you. Oh my goodness. This is the God in whom all of time and all of space exists. Stepping into your existence. He didn't just partake of your humanity in some theoretical abstract way. 
He partook of your humanity in the deepest sense possible. God is not unaware of anything that you've experienced. In fact, He is more acutely aware of you, of you than what you are. This is why this is why Jesus reveals a Father who even knows the number of hairs on your head. But we've never bothered with that. But this is a God who's more aware of your existence than what you are. And this is the event in which he comes to demonstrate in the person of Jesus Christ that your humanity is not just some something that I observe from a distance. Your humanity is something I partake of. I am, I am part of your existence. I am part of your humanity. And I'm not just part of the fun parts. I've been part of every part of your life. He entered what Romans calls sinful flesh. He entered your existence in, in the deepest way possible. He partook not only of your joy. The only reason he partook of that is because first and foremost he partook of your sin. In what way? Not because he personally sinned. But realize this, that sin in the first place is a mindset of separation. It, it manifests in lots of actions, but even the actions that people use to sin, who supplies the energy? You see, this is why God can keep man responsible for sin, because sin is not something we do in our own time and with our own energy. You do not have your own time or your own energy. Whatever time you have and whatever energy you have has been given. And this is why God can keep man responsible for sin because it's the very energy he supplied that we turned against it. And so God comes to reveal that, listen, I was part of everything you ever experienced, everything you've ever been gone through, even the times where you turned against me and sinned against me. I was part of that. But I have brought it to a final conclusion. I have brought it to a final end in my death. I've, I've come to reveal the good news and that is the end is near. In fact, I am your end. I have brought all that contradiction, all that sin to an end. And you see, he doesn't just embrace your humanity. He doesn't just tell you to get over things because he he is insensitive. It is because he fully embraces the depth of your pain. He fully embraces the, the, the shame, the guilt. He doesn't just come and tell us something about God and then goes back. He enters your help. He enters your depth. And the reason that he can deal with it so completely and so finally is because he did not make light of it. Oh. He embraced the full consequence and the full experience of your life. <laughs> oh, Jesus, thank you. And he brings it to a final end. <laughs> And it's only when we come to that place where we embrace the finality of our death in Him. You see, the secret of being free from distracted thoughts and habits 
It's not your self-discipline, your self-effort, your attempt to live a better life. No, your freedom is not in trying to live a better life. Your freedom is in dropping dead. Your freedom is when you embrace the death of Christ. And through the clarity of your insight, you come to this one conclusion. That this death is the final end of that old me. This death is where the relationship between me and sin was finally and forever completely severed. And it's through the clarity of your insight of your co-inclusion in his death. When you finally come to the conclusion that his story was indeed my story. <laughs> and because of that, my story is now his story. <laughs> he continues his life. He continues to, to tell this beautiful story of a God who's in love with man through your life. And so Jesus enters human existence not because he had to, but it was always the plan of God to be God with man, for man, and as a man. So when God designed man, knowing that he would be a man forever, he designed man as his favorite form of existence. Because he knew that he himself would commit his existence to humanity. And do you know what? God is still a man in the person of Christ Jesus. Yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> How can God become a man without ceasing to be God? The reason he can do that is because the qualities that makes God God is not his omnipotence, his omnipresence, his omniscience. All those things are true about God. But if he showed up displaying those qualities, he knew we would miss who he is once again. We had plenty of opportunity throughout the old covenant to witness God's omnipotence. And um, we did not know it. Jesus comes in Matthew eleven twenty seven, saying, no one knows the Father. Despite witnessing all these marvelous events. You see, Jesus shows up and he comes to reveal to us the core of what makes God, God. He whispered this to Paul as well when he said, You know, if I had all the faith, all the power to move mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. God's speaking about his own being as well. And he says, if I had all the knowledge, all the understanding to, to speak even the tongues of angels, but I have not love, I am nothing. God's revealing that, you know what, it's not my omnipotence that makes me me. It's not my omniscience that makes me me. It's not these other worldly qualities that makes me me. What makes me me is love. And the human existence is in no way a limitation for me to be fully myself. Because in the human condition, I can love. And this is exactly what God did. He displayed His love more clearly in the physical human body of Jesus Christ than anywhere else. This is why Colossians 2 verse 9 says, again amplified so beautiful, that 
God, the fullness of the Godhead, finds their most complete expression in the human body of Jesus Christ. That is why God could become a man without ceasing to be God. Oh my goodness. Because God is love. And this love is more clearly seen in the contrast of contradiction. We see, we see his love more accurately displayed in a body that's torn apart upon a cross than what we've seen it anywhere else. This is why God's excited about living his life all over again in you. Oh. And he's not nervous about the contradictions you're going to face. Because whatever contradiction you're going to face, is just another opportunity for him to reveal himself. To make himself known. Wow. Yeah. To live his life and express himself. Through you. Glory. Glory. Hallelujah. It feels like I've just started to give an introduction to this concept. But I, and there's so much to realize about this eternal God in whom you have your existence at your time, who came to summarize your existence and your time, to come and enter the temple, to enter your human existence, and activate once again the eternity that is placed within the heart of man. James speaks about the wisdom that is not of this world, a wisdom that is pure, and undefined. Wow. A wisdom that hasn't been affected by the experiences or the interpretations or the filters of this world. God wants to so, he is, he is so confident that you can remember where you began. And you have the most beautiful beginning. Wow. You began in the heart and the mind of God. He imagined a companion that would intrigue him for all eternity. And God has never, ever, ever changed his mind about who you are. In the gospel, he comes to just confront us with what he is persuaded of concerning you. And he's never going to reduce himself to five principles and seven steps for you to live a better life. He's always just going to hold up the mirror of who you are and say, hey, as little as I am able to reduce myself to seven steps and five principles, as little as that am I able to reduce the mirror of the word, the picture of Christ Jesus, to anything less than the revelation of who you really are. Oh. You just continue to look at the finality of what I've said and realize that what I said in your past, if you understand it correctly, it is the most relevant word for your present moment than what, you, uh, what you've ever heard. There's no new word more relevant than what God has spoken. And when you've realized what he said and the finality of it, it totally changes the expectation for the future. I, I quickly want to uh, uh, summarize with that because I started off with the story of Jesus that is both historic, present and future. The way in which it changes our futures, I remember as a little child we lived in a very hot spot in South Africa and in, near the Kruger Park it was dry, hot and I would so look forward to holidays where we would go to my grandparents and we would spend some time on the beach and oh, 
once a year we would make this journey. I remember the expectation, the hope to escape my present environment. The hope to escape the routine of school and the boringness of just normal life there. To just go be with grandparents at the beach. And um, once a year we would do this day and a half trip. And when I arrived at my grandparents, my expectation and my hope did not disappear, but it changed in nature. I was no longer excited or expectant about escaping my environment. I was now excited and expectant about exploring my environment. My hope was that I would never leave. My hope was that this joy that I experience now would never end. You see, the hope that Jesus brings is not a hope for you to escape. It's a hope. Uh, it, he first of all wants to overwhelm you with the significance of what he's done. The implications for this present moment, which is an awareness of union. Jesus defines eternal life as something that you know. In John 17 verse 3, he says, this is eternal life. That you know the Father and His Son. It doesn't define eternal life in terms of duration or in terms of location. He defines it in terms of something you know. <laughs> so what He revealed in Christ brings us to this place which He prepared for us so that we may be where He is. Where is that place? In that day you will know that I am in the Father, you are in me and I am in you. That's the place. It's a place of knowing your union with Him. And now our hope is not fixed on a future day. Our hope is fixed on a person that's already in us. Christ in us. And my expectation is that this joy, this union, I will explore it for all eternity without exhausting a fraction. Can you see how the, the New Testament eschatology was breathless with excitement? Because it wasn't based on a future day. The, the tension wasn't between now and tomorrow. The tension in New Testament eschatology was between what is here and present but not fully revealed. What is here already but not fully manifest. And, and I expect that what is in me is going to burst out any moment. <laughs> and that is why the, the, the excitement, the expectation is so imminent. Not that Christ would come from somewhere else, but that the Christ who has made his home within me is going to manifest himself. It's going to make himself known through me. That's why in 1 Corinthians 1 from verse 4 to 8 it says, You have been enriched in all things, in all knowledge and in all and the ability to express it. You are fully qualified. You do not lack anything. That's it. So you can fully expect the Lord Jesus Christ to make himself visible through you. That is the future expectation of this story. Is that what has happened is now a reality that will continue to unfold for the rest of my life. Glory, glory, glory.